This is Dave once again from the Wolves Den saying, Happy Tuesday. It's time for AIR Radio. And Jennifer Hillman will be back in just a few minutes with her guest. This is Dave once again from the Wolves Den studio saying, Hello, Tom Grasso. Tom, are you there? I am, yes, sir. Well, Tom is going to be Jennifer's guest as soon as we find Jennifer. But you're not. <laughs> you keep fading in and out, Dave. This internet is wonderful. Yeah, she's saying that she's uh, ready for you to call her. I am calling her. She's... Hello? Hello, Jennifer. Welcome Finally, back. the host arrives. <laughs> Go ahead, you two. Hey, you got, I got disconnected. I it was that sexual healing, excuse me, got me going. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Hey, Jennifer, since we're on the topic, I felt like I was in a hotel room waiting for you to knock at the door, and it just wasn't happening, so. <sighs> Darn. What, what the, the hell wrong, was that about? I, I knocked on the wrong door. What can I say? Oh, well. So, well, we're here. Okay. We're, we're here. Okay. Good morning, everyone. This is Abstract Illusions Radio, and this is Jennifer Hillman, and if you haven't gotten the hint yet, um, today's show is for a mature audience. It is about sex and love and quite the difference of them and the healing essence of love and sex and all in between. So if you please, if that's a topic that it may get explicit, so just giving you a heads up, Tom has wrote some beautiful pieces. We both write erotica. We understand the principles and the healing essence of sex and love, and we're going to talk about it today. So, Tom Gracio, welcome to the show. How are Thanks. you doing? I'm doing excellent. Uh, and I want to uh, add to that little disclaimer that you put. I'll tell you if uh, you or your significant other or somebody else you think can benefit from learning these types of things or hearing them or discussing them, uh, have them chime in too. Get them on the show or get them to listen in, and let's talk about some good stuff. Please feel free to Five seven, I'm sorry, five nine seven three. So um, call in and let's have some fun. Yes. Um, you brought up the topic. You said let's go for this. So I'm going to let you start by telling a little bit about the blog and the writing and how it got got started. Okay, it's um. <laughs> what the inspiration was. Well, that's just it. You know, I think in the last time we talked, you know, we we had uh, we had chatted on on the show. Um, I mentioned that I'm not really sure where the inspiration comes from. It just comes, and I don't resist it. Um, but more ordinarily than not, and, and particularly lately, um, since I'm more open to, uh, I guess, expressing those types of feelings. Uh, you know, it comes from different people that uh, you might meet or a, a person that you might have in, in your life that, that kind of stirs the pot within you. And, and I just feel that I'm fortunate enough to be able to take what I'm feeling and translate those things into words that other people can understand. Um, so there's a whole variety of things that give me inspiration. Sometimes there's absolutely no rhyme or reason for it, but it's there, so I, I just feel the need to share it or at least put it down on paper. So that's basically it. Uh, there's no there's no magic potion. There's no I, – I, I don't even know that that it's a talent as much as it is just a, uh, a fact that I'm very open to it and, and not afraid to uh, to share the experience. Even as uh, you know, and I find that's kind of rare in the male world, and I see it all around me with friends and colleagues and stuff like that. That we're so predetermined to play a particular role in our lives that we often ignore the very truth that's within us. And uh, I've just kind of made up my mind that I uh, I refuse to do that. So that's well, where it all don't comes. you? Well, the other thing about men is I think it's not necessarily that they're not open to it. I think it's the presentation or how they present themselves in delivering the experience or their insights on the subject, sometimes it can be not presented in the most uplifting and positive way. They kind of lower the experience, and that makes a huge difference. It does, and, and I think, you know, to some degree, 
it's not always the man's fault. I think a lot of times when we get into those types of situations, we have voices in our heads that we tend to listen to. And those voices can be maybe the male figures in our lives as we were growing up trying to teach us what men do. You know, to some, men don't cry. To some, you know, men have women on the side. To some, you know, we're all taught how to be men from a very young age. And and as we get older, a lot of times um, those voices can, play, can wreak havoc in our lives because the women that in our lives are taught the exact opposite of what we're taught. So, you know, we truly are in a situation a lot of times where, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And, and what I've tried to do in my life, particularly over the last couple of years, is let's bring us all to Earth where we happen to live and, and kind of split the difference, try to understand each other, but also just try to be true to ourselves and and not necessarily to our fathers or our friends or our society as a whole. Just find out what ticks inside you and what works for you, what works for you, which is a very important statement, and make that mm-hmm. the ultimate truth. And don't, you know, I, I, I've kind of latched on to a, uh, a quote that a, a very dear friend of mine shared with me, um, and it's, fear is a liar. And uh, I tend to think that when we're afraid to actually express ourselves, and um, cater to those feelings that we may have that we're taught we shouldn't, that we are just catering to fear. And it is a liar. And once you kind of release it, you start to find that there are a ton of people around you that are in the same boat, and they they kind of look at you as an example, or frankly, they may start to experience or experiment themselves. So it is a healing process, I think, because, um, you know, the... The avenues we're told as children can often scar us for a long time. And uh, I think true love, particularly, and sex is a dynamic part of love in all its various expressions, we can actually heal those things in a fun way, too. So. Well, in, in the same way with the woman. I mean, the woman, if she opens sexually, is often considered a slut or other not too kind words if they're really true to their expressing their feelings about sex and love and the intimacy so it's it's very much depending on how their parents or their friends or the society that they mingle in i do Mm -hmm. think a lot more people are becoming more open um to it which is good and bad and you have to use common sense with a lot of this what if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. And mm-hmm. and I really want to stress that the whole idea of sex does not give men the permission to do it against a woman or a man's or either sex actually. I don't want to discriminate here, um, to do it without their permission. But if it's consensual, it's consensual and that's the premise of it. So let's get to the heart of it with this mm-hmm. all being said. What is the difference between love and sex? And what is the healing essence within both? And what's the difference? Well, just just to disclaim, I think we talked about this before the show, is that these are just my experiences that I'm talking about. Obviously, I'm not, uh, I don't think everyone's going to agree with everything I say. Uh, we're all in different places in our lives at different times, and we all think differently based on our experiences and where we're at. So these are just mine. But... To, to answer your question, um, I, I don't know that there's much of a difference between sex and love, to be honest with you, except that truly great sex is a part of the loving process. And, you know, you can have a sexual experience with just about anyone, and you can find pleasure kind of like eating a good candy bar or, or whatever analogy you want to use there. I mean, you can you can have a really pleasurable experience with somebody without um, – without what we call love in our human experience, uh, devotion, Mm -hmm. commitment, um, loyalty, all those things that we tie up in that word love in a relationship. You can definitely have a mind-blowing experience that way. But in my life experience, what I've found is that if you find someone that you love deeply and that you feel a commitment to and a certain sense of loyalty to and a very deep spiritual connection, Um, it's no longer just sex. It is kind of something that transcends that whole idea of sex. It's no longer just a good porn scene. (laughs) You know, it's no longer just sweat and and all that kind of good stuff. 
it actually takes you to a much higher plane. And if when you're doing that with somebody who you not only love in that way, but who loves you in return, uh, I believe that that is the very essence of heaven on earth. That is exactly what we were, de- what we were designed to do. Um, that's exactly why we are humans, because we can experience those things. And I think we should experience those things. Um, and so to me, there's no difference between sex and love, but frankly, it is a, a very important c- component to love when you're with uh, with someone. Um, you know, sex is something that can just take you to a whole different level. Um, and even, I mean, something that you can do self-love. It's not necessarily just with a partner. You can love yourself, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and it can be a beautiful experience as well. Um, Even some of the masters like Osho really want people to get over that head trip of the difference between love and sex. I think Osho Osho put it it very nicely, Jen. I mean, he... He basically, and I'll paraphrase because I, I really can't quote the guy unless I cut and paste it, but, you know, you, we, we've turned something that is the most beautiful of human experiences and created a wound out of it, and that's what he defines sex as, you know, something that we have created an absolute wound, and, you know, we make it dirty, and we make it something that we should shy away from, and we make it just absolutely one of what could be one of the worst human experiences, Um and that's, that's really a shame, but you mentioned the self-love, and it all comes down to the fact that unless you absolutely love yourself, you, you find great joy in yourself, that you don't mind being alone because you love the company you're keeping, and you really don't have a dependency on another person. You just kind of maybe even have a need or a craving or something like that for them, but you don't have a dependency on them. Um, all those things that you find in the self-love aspect of things, and, and sex is no different. You, we've turned that into an absolute travesty, I think. And we mentioned our child life. And if, if you notice, boys and girls are basically the same at a certain age. They're experimental. They're, they're interested mm-hmm. in their own bodies. They're playing with themselves. They're, they're doing things that their parents will immediately stop them from doing and tell them that they shouldn't do those things. We immediately create shame and guilt, and something that is truly a natural and beautiful experience. And I, I liken that in my analogous way to parents are giving their kids the same apple Eve gave Adam, and we're creating shame and guilt where none should exist, and, and it's a shame. But because of that, I think we start to kind of loathe ourselves at a young age, and then we keep on all the experiences of childhood and maybe horrible our archetypes, our parents are horrible, or or maybe our friends are bad people or whatever. We want to heap onto a child who's developing. And we turn that absolute most beautiful of experiences into something that is just the opposite. It's something we need to hide away. And um, I always hated the fact that that uh, people were afraid of public displays of affection. Like you shouldn't hold hands or kiss in public or just give each other this loving hug and you shouldn't do that in front of the children. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's exactly where you should be doing it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you should be sharing that, that, that thing that you have with your partner or partners, whatever the case may be, with everyone. Why are we so afraid of it? You know? uh, random acts of violence seem to be more acceptable in American society than public displays of affection, and I kind of think that's conducive to why sex is such a problem in our society. And it's yeah. it's very it's it's interesting the difference between the Europeans' expression of and feelings about love and sex versus the American. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like totally. I mean, I understand there's very much the the prudish and the religious aspects that have come to America that really holds it back of the natural flowing essence of what love and expressing that love can be to um, the point that it can be very, very ugly and really used against the very principles of what it really is, Mm -hmm. which is an expression of love is, I mean, God is love. I mean, the purest essence of man is love. 
and yet well, we're trying to make ourselves. You and I, I believe that. You and well, I believe yeah. that, Jen. And I, and many of the people that that I'm uh, involved in, and um, and so on and so forth, are believe that. But our society as a whole still believes it's a religious society based on a religion that completely creates shame and guilt in the, every sexual act, regardless of what it is. If it goes beyond the missionary position in the bedroom, um, boy, you might go to hell. I mean, it's... What do you mean, uh, might? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, to me, I'm like, no, no, if it goes beyond the missionary position, I'm in heaven, baby. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not a hell thing for me at that point. But it, it's... And, and I'll tell you where where I come to that conclusion. One of many. I went to Catholic school, and uh, I used to argue with nuns and priests my entire career, you know, my entire time in school because I just couldn't buy this stuff they were teaching me. But you know, you become a little bit assimilated to it. And ironically, my first experience with I'll call it pornography was in my Catholic school library. They had a book on um, you know how to have sex. I don't know what it was called, how to make love or whatever. Um, and in it. You know, they had pictures um, and a description. And the description of the sexual act was exactly this. A man enters a woman, he thrusts a few times, he ejaculates, and he falls asleep inside her. That's exactly the description of the sexual act that it was given in that book. So I remember I was reading this, and I was about in seventh grade, I think. And I was like, oh, my God, that's horrible. <laughs> Jesus, God. Who wants to do that? That's got to be the most boring thing I've ever heard of. I don't want anything to do with that. And, um, you know, it took me a few years before I realized that you know, that book was kind of, it was written probably by people who weren't in happy relationships. But, you know, once you, once you start to realize that, that uh, you are in complete control of yourself and, and you can choose to listen to the voices of educators and parents and priests and nuns and, and all those things, you can choose to listen to them. Or you can kind of write your own book instead of reading it. You can actually start to say, I want to experience things. And, people start to come into your lives that actually help you experience those things once you've made the choice to do it. And um, you can also make the choice to turn all those experiences into a bad thing where it becomes an addictive process, or you can turn it into something which is just the opposite, which is just a beautiful thing that you get to experience. You know, I'm here. Well, let's, let's have some fun. And, right. And, um, you know, you can find that in, in your relationships and, and all those things that usually you can determine the health of your relationship based on the quality of the sex you're having. That's usually the first thing that goes. <laughs> so, sex is a very it, important. Well, yeah. it's also the the openness of the conversation about sex. I mean, if you are talking to someone and they shut down when you're just talking about their likes or dislikes within sex, gives you a huge understanding of where they are on it mm -hmm. oh you, so, you can feel everything in, in that act so i mean growing up for me i mean i was the youngest of five kids and my parents were pretty open about sex in you know at an early age i was able to look at a playboy no problem my dad was you know we cracked jokes about it we were allowed to look at the joy of sex um but we snickered when we were young, but at the same time, we were open, we were allowed to be open to, ex to see what was out there, to understand the human experience. Mm -hmm. So it makes a huge difference of how open. Now, when I started talking to other people, that's what shut me down, was society saying, you can't talk like that, you know, within my family, it's like, no problem. But it was going outside, and then if you talk openly, there's some men that say, oh, she's easy. That doesn't mean it's true. So just now, because I talk about it. means just the opposite. It, it, it yeah. literally means just the opposite sometimes. And, and because I think women who are intuitive to their sexuality and their presence in, in the bedroom particularly also know what they want. And, and I love the feminine power. I absolutely adore women who know what they want, and they, they don't have any hesitation to go after it. And and um, because I find women are much more sensitive and much more intuitive to the world around them than most of us men are. So you, you get into that position where, you know, you find a woman who absolutely knows what she wants. She's not afraid to, to go after it. That by far does not mean she's easy because it's 
she's not in if she's not into the, the whole experience she doesn't need to have it it's not something she doesn't feel an obligation to anyone but herself and you know it's kind of a beautiful thing so i find the more people i i experience that are sexually liberated are quite the opposite of the the, the repressed pent up uh unable to quite experience sex as, as in the in the way we're talking um, those oppressed women just seem to not have a whole grasp on even who they are. So, yeah, it's quite the opposite, Jen. <laughs> Believe it. Yeah. Now, we do have a call-in. Um, mm -hmm. Venus is on the line that wanted to ask you a question. Venus, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you for taking my call. Ah, hello. Awesome. Thank you for calling. Now, <laughs> you asked me to ask a question. It's like, you ask. <laughs> sure. Uh, hey, Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? It's so nice to hear your voice. Same here. Same here. Excellent. Yeah. I love the forum. Love the format. WolfSpiritRadio.com. Excellent. Thank you for hosting Tom today. Tom, I You're love your writing. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, dear. I, um, you know, as you know, I've just recently uh, made contact with you mm -hmm. on another social network. Mm -hmm. And have to say, I am blown away, not only in how you articulate your feelings and express yourself sexually, but the depth mm -hmm. and the detail, right? And um, you had written a piece, I think it was about a month ago, that was BDSM related. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated with me, and I would just like if you could, um, on that with the audience, and I'll go ahead and hang up, maybe read a little bit from that. It was just enthralling and uh, very sexually charged, but beautiful. So can you share that with us? And yeah, Venus, you don't, have, you don't have to hang. I knew it. I knew it. The boys up and up in Redmond, Washington, are just never happy about Wolf Spirit Radio, so they've got to keep constantly cutting me off. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Eight, five, six, seven. This is one of those... Hello? Yeah, they... they hang on, Venus. They cut... See, uh, one of the things that happens with Wolf Spirit Radio is we get cut off oh, okay. by the boys up in the fusion centers because they uh, seem to think that that's their job is to interfere with the truth getting okay. out about so many subjects. Yeah, Jen, we know. We're working on it. This this happens has happened to every live show I've produced for the last three weeks. And I simply refuse to play in their sandbox with their rule. Hello. Welcome back, Thomas. The boys up in the fusion centers, you know, they're playing their games this morning. And we're not playing in their game with their sandbox. They're playing in my sandbox with my game. And that is, you can't beat us, guys. You really <laughs> can't beat us. All right, so are we back? Uh, I'm waiting We're for all back, I think. Waiting for Jennifer now. I'm calling her back. All right, good. Um, Hang on. Let me try it this way. Yeah, I see she's trying to get you. Uh, one of the best questions of the day, too. Jeez, Dave. <laughs> I know. That's a, that's a super question. But I lived that lifestyle for a lot of years, and I just got tired of, you know, Everything I wanted, nothing the woman wanted. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't need this. That to me is a sign you're with the wrong woman. It's still quite a lot. My, my, my. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, is that you? No, that is Venus. Ah, I'm with. <laughs> You're still there, so let's talk. I understand. It's frustrating. <laughs> I used to do this for a living. Well, good. Let's talk. <laughs> so ah, there we go. I found it. You got her. You got her back. I oh, I just I'm calling host. her back right now. <laughs> okay. I really hate to go on without the host. Did you call? <laughs> Jen. Jen. Hi. So um, I apologize. My my Skype decided to keep logging me out without me touching it, and so I apologize. So, 
Venus, I was asking your experiences. If you said something and answered this question, I apologize. Um, but what are your what are your feelings on the subject? Your experiences, and what is it about? What I mean, I know he's very sensual. He's very much present in his writing. Tom is amazing with expressing himself in words. Um, there's a tenderness and a gentleness and a realness in his writing. Mm -hmm. What was it that kind of led you to Tom? I mean, was there something you were looking for? Had you been reading his his stuff and this one just kind of hit you more than some of his other pieces? Um, are you asking me, Jen? Yes, I am. Yes. Um, I actually had just kind of come across some of Tom's writings by chance. And when I read his writing on erotica, because I've also written erotica and uh, very involved in uh, BDSM-related adult entertainment, I, uh, when I read it, I thought, okay, not only obviously is Tom writing it um, because he loves to write, but he's writing erotica and looking it. And there's a difference. And you can feel it when you're reading mm -hmm. the writing. And I was really taken um, by Tom's way of writing. I mean, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, you... he wrote a BDSM piece, and I thought, wow, he nailed it. He nailed it. Hmm. You know, the, so... the, funny, the funny thing is about that, though, is that that particular... Piece I'd never experienced, and and um, you know, so it was just kind of a, maybe a fantasy, or or uh, yeah, I really can't explain what it was. I hate that part about the writing process is that often I have no idea where it comes from. But but uh, I, I do write some erotica, and I've been advised to create a pen name, so I've done all that. But you know, I I, I, I view erotica in a in a different way, and. I'm not sure that that entire genre will kind of maybe want to even uh, participate in the way I, I do it. And because I, I really want to invoke the spiritual side of of a good sexual experience into the erotica piece, that, that it's not all about two strangers meeting on an elevator and fucking. It, it's, it's not about that all the time. Uh, it, it is also about two people who absolutely have a deep love and adoration for one another and what they mm -hmm. are willing to be open to in that dynamic, that interaction, that, that relationship, what, what, where they're willing to bring each other in that whole thing. And, it, you know, it's, it's about keeping it real in the relationship and about being able to fully express yourself to your partner without – the fear of judgment or of being shot down or any of that stuff. So, and and as Dave and I were talking as we were waiting to to get back on, and he mentioned that you know he's kind of in that lifestyle, which you know, I, okay, maybe it's a lifestyle, maybe it's not, but but you know, he, he said, well, you know, the women, choice. yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a choice to be completely liberated. You walk where you want to walk, you do what you want to do, and you know, frankly, if you can find somebody else that's beating the same note as you, it's not anything other than a, a journey. It, it, it's not a discussion. It's not a debate. It's not a, I'll do this for you. It's not a trade-off. It is just, hey, you want to go here? I want to go with you. I want to come here? Can you come along? And yes. And when you find that in a partner, you absolutely have, you, you find all those issues that plague human you know, marriages today and, and um relationships they kind of all vanish because that is where you you should be at least your mo your most vulnerable yeah. is in mm -hmm. that portion of your life with your partner so i want to when i write erotica i really want to try to bring that out like like the woman in that piece a uh, man in that piece that we were talking about um in my mind they were in a relationship it could have been a 30 year relationship they could have been 70 years old at that point it could have been whatever but they were bringing each other to a certain place that neither one of them was quite comfortable in, but willing to go there with that person and and experience it and push their boundaries a little bit. And at the end of that, just kind of sink into each other. Because you know what? 
It's not just the traumatic events that bring two people closer. It's also those times when you're willing to go that little, little bit past your envelope uh, yeah. with someone, and that just brings you closer together. And I mentioned, I think, that if you're in a marriage or a relationship and the sex is suffering, that's the first indication that the relationship should end. Because if you can't be intimate with someone and you can't bring them places they wish to go and you can't do those things, that is not the person for you because the intimate side okay. of your relationship is the truth. Everything and else can is I add there. on that, Tom? Mm -hmm. Can I interject on that thought? Sure. So I think oftentimes in relationships, new, old, tried, true, suffering, thriving, that oftentimes we, as mates, forget that there's consensual and that there is also in BDSM what we call consensual non-consent. And that it is okay to push the envelope sexually. It is okay to, um, to go down a path with your mate that may not be familiar to you because you want to be pleasing because you want to thrive, because you want to grow and stay stay alive. And that if there's open communication and discussion sexually, and that relationship, you know, can bear that, yeah, oh, then, yeah. then grow and thrive and uh, do new things and push the envelope and get nasty and make go dark. Bring in the light. Do it all. But live. Thrive. And remember, it's consensual. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You're in the privacy of your own home. Do it. Enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's the. Th that's a beautiful thing I wish I could hear priests say during homily of a mass. <laughs> you're, you're never going to hear it, but... But, but you, you, you take a you take a whole cold hard look at your relationships, and and they have to be self serving. You know, we we mentioned Osho earlier, and he's all about true selfishness. And you know, we're never talking about that thing where I'm going to go steal the last piece of bread from you because I'm a prick. We're talking about that selfishness that says, you know what, the only way I can truly make my partner or my children or the people in my life happy is if I'm happy myself. And so. By taking care of the self, by doing things that bring you joy, by doing things that make you happy, by fully being fully expressive and loving who you are in that expression, I can bring that to other people in my life who are a part of it. And they can choose whether or not to accept it. And I don't hold judgment if, you know, and I had this discussion on a, on a book club um, Facebook site uh, not too long ago, is that you know they felt so judged by people when they were talking about wanting to be in a in a male male female menage, and and I said uh, basically if you're judging them for having that reaction, you're doing the same thing that you think they're doing to you, and you can't be judgmental against people who don't share your beliefs and expect them not to be to you. You have to at some point accept who you are love who you are, be happy with it, everything that you stand for. And if you're not happy with something you stand for, maybe you shouldn't stand for it. And then soon you'll find people coming into your life that feel the same way, and you'll be willing to embrace them, and you'll be willing to you know, include them in, into your life. And you'll find so much happiness there that there's really no room for anything else. And I think often, and I, in that piece that you posted about you know how to make love to an angel, it's kind of where in in our human interactions, at least in the society, we do it just the opposite. You know, we'll be at a bar, we'll be in an event, we'll be somewhere, and we'll see somebody and we'll go, holy shit, that, that she looks hot. And and we, we approach them from a very primal perspective of, I want you. And right. if we get them in a consensual way, like you mentioned, and we love that experience of what we had, both male and females do the same thing, that we love that experience experience we had the sex was just awesome well now all of a sudden we start building a fantasy of physical and emotional stuff that goes along with the physical and and none of that can sustain itself because the sex will eventually in that type of relationship get old and boring and we'll get tired of it and then you know hey we'll either cheat or the, the relationship <laughs> will be over so? or you know the emotional 
fantasy that we created, like, oh, this person loves me, they'll stand behind me forever, the slightest failure of that fantasy becomes a major drama. Same thing with, you know, the psychological dependency we create in that experience. We do it bass backwards in this society, it seems. But if you can find someone, and I call it the holy trinity of love, if you can find someone that you're really into physically, I mean, you look at that woman and, and from a male perspective, and you go, holy cow, i got to have you. But that feeling isn't just in the physical realm. It's also when you talk to her and you, also when you communicate and also when you just a simple touch or simple look and, or the simple way she does things for you or touches you or even when you wake up in the morning and she happens to be there and you go, holy cow. You know, that same feeling that you feel in the bedroom translates to every aspect of your life. You have a relationship that is basically bomb-proof. Uh, nothing can go wrong in that relationship and i think often in our in our lives we settle for that experience that starts in the bedroom physically and it closes the doors for every other experience that we might have that might be better for us it might be more true for us and and we start to feel constrained in the relationship and and then we have kids and the next thing you know it's like oh no we got to stay together for the kids and um but we're miserable and then we pretend that we're okay. You know, uh, you know, we're good friends. Well, we have a friendly thing. We're good roommates, whatever. We start to pretend yeah. that this very limited thing that we're in that isn't really for us is for us. And we end up getting older, more miserable, more jaded. And sooner or later, we find our life's over. And we've never experienced anything that we've wanted to. And so I've, I've said, no, in my personal life, I do not commit easily. I don't want any relationship. I don't care if it's I, – I, I'm very focused on what I need in my life, and I embrace what I need in my life, and I refuse to fill my cup with anything else other than what I want in my life. That's pure selfishness, it's, but it's a holy selfishness because the woman that that ends up with me and that I end up with her, that relationship is going to be bomb-proof, and it's going to be something based on mutual respect, trust, love, adoration, and filthy, dirty sex if that's where it goes. And why not? Why should it be shameful <laughs> to include all that stuff into the, the, the microcosm of our lives? You know, um, It's silly to me. It's absolute, and I've done it. <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, who hasn't? I'm 40, I'll be 46 in a couple of weeks, and... In my 45, almost 46 years, I've done everything I, I say we shouldn't do. But that's how I know I shouldn't do it because it's never right. served me well. It's never worked for me. It's always failed. It's always created sorrow and suffering. It's always created bad things in my experience while creating some good things. I've got three beautiful kids that were created in that experience that I wouldn't trade for anything. But now I've also said that my role as a parent changes. My primary role is not to teach my kids how to make money and how to become successful in, in life. It is to define their idea of success, and that is you've got to be happy. When you find something that doesn't make you happy, now, in a relationship, you're not going to be happy all the time, but, but if your long-term happiness is at stake, get out of it. Do not stay in it. Do not make up these dreams that you need to or that you're fucking get out of it. Move on, yeah. because that door closes and something better is down the road. Don't question it. Don't doubt it. Don't ever sacrifice your happiness for the ideas of everyone else around you. And that is my role as a parent with my children, is to teach them those things and not, not to give in, not to cater to their mother, who might have a different belief than I do. That's why we're no longer married. But, frankly, to stay the course. And I'm finding that there are people like you, Jen, like you, Venus, and, you know, some notable others that have come into my life that absolutely feel the same way. There are a ton, there are a ton of us out there, but once you release all of these, this baggage you're carrying, you're free to go find them. And then your life becomes exponentially happier. And I'm a one-woman kind of guy. I'm looking for that one woman to to be with and now, I'm not in the menage and all that stuff. I just, it's not for me. So if I'm with a woman and she desperately needs that, I'm not going to stop her. I say go to town, but that relationship may not be for me. So it's, it's defining where you are and what brings you happiness and joy and all those things. And then not kind of settling for anything else because it's just not fair to the person that you that you love. It's not, per, it's not fair to you. It's not fair to them. 
you know, because every failure in a relationship that I've had, the partner I've been with has failed too. And that's not something that I find particular joy in. So, so Tom, can I interject here for a minute? Of course. So on that note, you know, moving forward, getting out of um, – relationships that are no longer serving us, that are creating misery, dysfunction, hurt, suffering, etc. What's your take, what's your thoughts on, you know, uh, being, in effect, an instrument of growth? And that mm-hmm. if these relationships are no longer serving us and we continue to move forward and attract into our lives what it is that we so desperately want, need, and desire. Mm-hmm which is to be sexually satisfied and emotionally satisfied and balanced out and thriving and growing, then we're all serving a purpose regardless. And it's maybe just a different time in our journey, a different time in space. Mm-hmm. That's that on true. I mean, um, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, one it, thing about a relationship that is really necessary is the growth. It's that exploration and the discovering of yourself as you share yourself with someone else, it is understanding you are pushing that energy and that place that you thought you were stuck in exploring the possibilities of a different position or a different way of kissing or a different place of kissing or touching or kissing or licking or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a conversation with no words. The energy and the intensity of just looking at someone and even even with Tantra, there there are exercises in Tantra where you don't even touch anybody. You just sit in front of each other and look and touch with the eyes, not with the physical, mm-hmm. but with the spiritual, which just deepens the experience all so much more. Because that's mm-hmm. the complete yes. and, and raising it up to a whole different level. Yes. Yeah, it's it's all part of a of a process, and you're right, Jen. I mean. We often call, and you know, when we get out of a relationship, a time of growth. What, what I'd like to see, at least in my life, is the relationship itself being a catalyst for it. And that's why, you know, in, in the um, the BDSM piece that uh, Venus had, had mentioned, is is it's about growth. And and you know. It, if you if you look at sex as a very spiritual activity, and you mentioned Tantra, and I, I love Tantra, I think it's absolutely something we should be teaching in school, is that you, you can – it's very difficult to simply grow in the physical sense. It's very difficult to grow exponentially in the psychological or emotional distra- uh, um, self. It, it, it depends on where you're at as a baseline, but it's very difficult to have explosive growth psychologically and emotionally, particularly if you don't have explosive growth sexually with your partner. You can only go so far in the physical realm. You can only go so far in the psychological realm. But the spiritual and sexual realm is unlimited. So if you really truly want growth in your relationship. That's where the focus is. And guess what? It is self-serving. The reason why it feels so good is because you're supposed to be doing it. It's not It's not the way you're taught, it's, you know, in, in religion where because it feels so good, you shouldn't be, which is often the case. The reason it feels so good is because that is something you should be doing all the time. And all the time, I mean, hell, if you feel like it five times a day, if, you're, if you can handle it physically, sure. I mean, we talked about physical limitations. Everyone has them. But guess what? If physically you look at your woman or she looks at you and bang, it happens, and it happens to be the fifth time in the morning, go to town. I mean, there should not be any of these crazy limitations we put, put ourselves through. So, But if there are, there's good news. If you're in a relationship and you're very limited sexually, uh, I mentioned that there's baselines that we start at to measure growth. You know, seedling becomes a sapling, becomes a tree. You know, we, we all start at a particular level. So if you feel very limited in your relationship and you have that discussion with your partner and your partner is into it, first of all, if your partner's into it, you know absolutely you've got a good relationship. If your partner kind of, eh, I'm not really into it, no, I don't want to do that, blah, okay, maybe it's time for that relationship to end. But if your partner is into it, you can 
absolutely experience infinite growth in yourself, in your relationship, and in your life. There is no cap on spiritual and sexual growth, none whatsoever. So, I could not agree with you more. Well, it, it is, again, um, there are many types of sex, Jen. There's just this yeah. one for pleasure, friends with benefits, all that happy stuff that we hear about. Uh, but when we're talking about truth in a in a real, meaningful, committed, loyal, loving, unlimited relationship, you'll find that you could be in your 80s and you still have not reached your full potential. It's nothing about sexual peak. It's about potential. And it, it's just the practice of trying to get there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people, you know, I, I, I love those older those older couples that may or may not have been together forever, it doesn't matter. But here they might be in their 90s and maybe not physically able to do what we can do in our 40s, 30s, and 50s, whatever, okay? Um, but they're still there. And you can see right. the absolute adoration for each other in their eyes. And you can just see it when they talk about each other. And then you hear yeah. when one passes on, one transitions, the other one is soon to follow. That, to right. me is what I'm talking about, because one day I may not be able to perform. I, I, I'm not sure that I see that happening, but one day I may not be able to perform. <laughs> and, it's always and I, thing you say. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. Even in my, you know, I remember when I was in my 20s going, you know, i got to do this as often as possible because when I'm in my 40s, I won't be able to. Now that I'm in my 40s, I feel like I'm, I'm much better than when I was in my 20s, and I just can't see it ending. It's like, ah, i got so much left in me. So it's... um. What? So it's this kind of, uh, you know, that, that type of connection is only, it's not gained by being emotionally dependent on one another. It's not gained by being psychologically into one another. That's friendship, and that might last forever. But that type of connection I'm talking about is gained in the bedroom or in the elevator or on the beach or in the woods or in their backyard or in your car or wherever you decide to practice it. That's where that commitment and that loyalty and that devotion is attained. And if we well, it, it, I, I have to say my parents had that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad died when he was 81 years old. When he was, it was like six months before he died, I was here and I, I was talking to him in the kitchen and my mom walked in and my mom just looked at him. And my dad just looked at him and said, she is still the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it was the most sensual and most beautiful expression my dad has ever said about my dad and about my mom. It was just like, oh, my God, that is true love. There mm -hmm. was amazing energy with that. And she just smiled and, and went on, on her way. But it was like I know they were still sexually active up to the time he died. I mean, they – express their love physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. They were best friends, and it was beautiful mm -hmm. to really witness it. And it's like, okay, that's what I want. You know, I want to have that connection with someone, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to cut myself short. Um, so it's really kind of an interesting um, thing to try and understand how are they so lucky to find it? I mean, they were together for 56 years. Wow. That's a long mm. time. Wow. And, uh, it, it, and they always had that love, even though at moments they wanted to kill each other. I mean, they had their debates. They had their fights. But that friendship and that faith of true love was always there, that respect, mm. that caringness, that support. Even though they had different ideas on something, it was always present. And that's something that I witnessed my entire life, to be able mm -hmm. to be individual and yet share this really impressive sense of what love is. Well, it's, it's funny because if you have that, that real connection with someone, the different ideas and the little conflicts that you get in lose their importance. Um, it, yeah, it's, funny. it's true. It's funny how much forgiveness that you can find in your heart for somebody that you desire deeply. All of a sudden, the fact True that, enough. yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like all of a sudden, um, you know, the fact that, um, I don't know, <laughs> pick out anything us human beings argue about in the relationship. All oh. of a sudden, that thing is, doesn't oh, matter. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 
you know, it's all. It's like sometimes if you, you know, you think about it, you, you just want a, a chocolate ice cream cone so bad you don't count the calories anymore. You're like, I'm just going to eat this thing. I don't care. And that's almost kind of like where you can go in a relationship. I mean, it's a, probably a bad analogy, but you can almost kind of get that way in a really good relationship with someone to where all this bullshit. And, and <laughs> it, the little things don't matter. No. Because you're so happy, you're so filled up, and you're thriving. It's easy to work through things. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think yeah. that that the woman I'm with, if she really wants me, can overlook the fact if I'm wearing brown socks with sandals. Now, of course, I don't do that. But, exactly. But if I came out and she <laughs> – But if you it did. Would, it wouldn't become a big deal. And you know what? Yeah, if she exactly. says something to me, I'd say, well, you get over here and take them off then. Because that yeah. is – you know, we want to pretend that sex isn't the truth and the connection, but it is the real truth. It, it is, it is the the absolute indicator of everything in our relationship with the woman we care about or love. It's also the indicator of a relationship that's not going to go any further than that experience. Yeah, you know it when you're. At least I do. I, I know it when I'm with someone sexually, whether or not at that moment this relationship is going to be anything other than what it is right now. And I don't and pretend. <laughs> And I don't pretend. I don't lie to anybody. Don't pretend. You know, you just enjoy that moment and you go on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it's an indicator of so much more, right? Mm -hmm. It could be. Tom, it can be so much more, and I think that's what we're talking about here today, Tom. I think that's what you're bringing to the table, is that it can be so much more, so much more fulfilling, and enrich our lives. And our relations and our day-to-day um, goings and doings, how we share ourselves, how we engage one another, just like we are right now, it can be so much more. And I think just acknowledging that we're paying attention is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're it's talking a, it's a, about it. It's about awareness, and you know, to all those people who go out and buy the Eckhart Tolle books and the Wayne Dyer books and. Yeah, I've read them all, and I've got Krishna Merity, and I love Osho. I could read that forever. What, you know, once you start to find it, you develop an awareness of everything around you. Um, I don't know if it, either of you have, have uh, either watched the movie or read the book called The Peaceful Warrior. And, uh-huh. you know, in that, you know, one of the characters mm-hmm. says there's never not something going on. There's always something going on. And we, we just aren't aware of them. But once you slow your life down a little bit, mentally and you start becoming aware of everything around you, um, Mm -hmm. you don't need those books. You start to write your book instead of reading it. And and then you start to find in in that keen awareness, and often we're told to stop thinking about ourselves, which is kind of crazy. We should be thinking more about ourselves. But then, then you become aware of yourself and who you are. And you're not afraid to tell somebody in, that you're in, in a relationship with where it stands. And you're not afraid to to be honest with the world around you. And, uh, you know, there's movies. and you, I mean, I remember one time I was sitting in an office and this guy came in. He was kind of whistling and he had a real pep to his step. And, and somebody whispered to me, hey, he must have just got laid. And I'm kind of thinking, you know how true that is? <laughs> you know, how, how, how awesome is it that we all, when we have good sex with Hi. Uh, guess what, my brothers and sisters? They did it to me again. Hello. Good morning to you. They did it to us again. I can't believe these idiots. Well, you know, think of it, Dave. If we look at the time, it is time to take a break. <laughs> hey, I can arrange that. I got it already set up. We'll be back. In so, about, we'll be back in about four. We'll be back in a bit, folks. So just relax and enjoy. Woo! <laughs> 